After the rule of Diocletian, there were many contenders for the next ruler of Rome. Constantine is chosen as emperor, but when he returned to Rome to take the throne, he had to face a much larger and stronger army than his in order to take his place as emperor. During the battle, Constantine sees a vision of his army leaving the battle victorious with the sign of Christ. The sign is the first two Greek letters of Christ's name, Chi and Rome. Constantine believes the vision and orders his troops to put the sign on their banners and shields. Just as the vision tells him, Constantine's small army wins the battle. Constantine believes that the God, Son of God, who his Christian mother Helena worships, helped him to win the battle. When Constantine ascends to the throne, he has to agree to share the power with another emperor who rules the eastern half of Rome while Constantine controls the west. In 313, the Edict of Milan legalizes Christianity in Rome. Constantine begins to give the Christians more and more rights and favors during his rule, and Christianity becomes the favorite religion of the emperor. The Christians are allowed to practice and preach freely and openly, not in secret as before. The clergy don't have to pay taxes, and Christian churches are built. When Constantine defeats the emperor in the east in 324, he decides to move the capital to the east because Rome is very run down. The new capital is called Byzantium, or New Rome. Later, it is called Constantinople after Constantine. Now it is Istanbul, Turkey. As Constantine tries to unite his people, he decides to entwine the Christian church and Roman politics. He becomes more involved in church affairs, and the Christians become allies with the Roman Empire. The problem with this connection is that the Christians have to decide whether to stay strong in their faith or be faithful to the ruler who has given them so much. This problem continues in the church for centuries to come and is one of the main reasons for the present-day separation between church and state. Constantine's largest impact on Christianity was his legalization and acceptance of the faith. Shortly before his death in 337, Constantine was baptized as a Christian. Theodosius I was the emperor of Rome from 379 to 395. He was the last Roman emperor to rule over both the eastern and western parts of the Roman Empire. Theodosius made Christianity the official religion of Rome in 380. Making Christianity the official religion of Rome completed the reversal of the Christian church status. Theodosius also pronounced the Arian heresy illegal in 392. During his rule, Christians began to fight in the Roman army, and eventually, by the year 500, only Christians were allowed in the army. This is ironic because early Christians were pacifist and refused to fight. Theodosius greatly impacted Christianity by allowing it to grow as the official religion of Rome and encouraging more people to follow Christ. From Theodosius, we can learn to not try and change people because if Theodosius had not had Christians fighting in the army, Christians could possibly still be pacifists today and religious wars could have been avoided. While the church was just starting out in the early centuries, there were groups of Christians that believed that they had a knowledge that others did not. This group of people, called Gnostics, believed that the world of matter was evil and the world of the spirit was good. This is shown in the painting of the evil material world where a spirit does not belong. As Christians, we know that evil does exist in this world, so why is this a heresy? Gnostics believe that the world and humans are evil, and if Jesus was human, he was therefore evil and couldn't have come from God. Since they still believe Jesus came from God, they claim that Jesus wasn't actually human, but just an apparition. But there were people that opposed Gnosticism. Irenaeus, a bishop at that time, argued that Jesus was human because he died on the cross as an example of the sacrifice of his faith, which is similar to the martyrs at that time in the early church. In response to the disunity around the Christian community, the Apostles' Creed was written to be used at baptism for those that desired to join the church. They were required to apprehend and consent this, to the statement of beliefs before they entered the church. Today, we experience the results of Gnosticism through the Apostles' Creed. Also, church leaders at that time used complex philosophical intellect which stayed straight from the teachings passed down by the Apostles. As a result, even today, some changes have been made to correspond with the faith of the early church. The Arian Heresies After the persecutions, the Arian Heresy arose around the time of Constantine. This Arian heresy eventually divided the church for years. The name Arians came from the teachings of an Alexandrian priest by the name of Arius. The main characteristic of Arians is their denial of Jesus' divinity. Arians did not believe that Jesus could be as divine as God. In fact, they thought it was almost an insult to say so. To try and solve this controversy, 
the first Council of Nicaea was held. At this council, 318 bishops attended. It is said that there were 318 for every participant in Abraham's household. After some time, the council came to the conclusion that the Arian beliefs were wrong. The Arian teachings were wrong because they went against the tradition of the church and the belief that Jesus is God and human. To make the fact that Jesus is divine more clear, the Nicene Creed was written. The Nicene Creed emphasizes that Jesus is both God and human being. The Creed also reiterates that Jesus is not created by God, but that he is one with God. After the Council of Nicaea, Arian beliefs were still very prevalent. A man named Athanasius was a church leader who helped stifle Arian beliefs. Athanasius had a great quote to explain the beliefs of Christians toward this matter. The quote is about the Word of God and says, The Word of God had become man, so that you might learn from a man how a man may become God. This means God sent Jesus in human form to show that humans have the capability to act like God. A great analogy that Athanasius used was his comparison of God and Jesus to brightness and light. He said Jesus is related to God as brightness is to light. They cannot be separated, and Jesus is God's reflection. Athanasius was constantly being forced out of his office as a bishop and ended up being in exile for 17 years. However, despite these obstacles, Athanasius was still able to preach and get his beliefs across. Finally, by the year 392, Emperor Theodosius banned Arianism. However, some people still practiced it outside the empire, but this eventually died out. Arian heresies impacted the church by deepening the belief that Jesus is divine. It also created the Nicene Creed, which we still use today. Lessons we can learn from the topic of Arian heresies today is that Jesus truly is divine and a part of God. In 325, a church council is called by Constantine, who is the emperor at this time. This worldwide council assembled in Nicaea, a small town close to Constantinople. At this time, the majority of the church was made up of North Africans, Syrians, Palestinians, and people in Greece and Asia Minor. Because of this, many of the bishops who attended came from the East. More than 300 bishops attended, and with all their cultural backgrounds, disagreements occurred. The council assembled to address the Arian heresy, after much dispute, Arius was declared a heretic. To incorporate the belief that Jesus is both God and human, the council made a more elaborate creed called the Nicene Creed, which is still around today. The creed addresses the heresy and states that Jesus wasn't made by God, but is one with him. This means that Jesus is both human and divine. Arius never backed down in his beliefs, and many Eastern Church followers, as well as bishops, believed what Arius spoke was true, despite the fact that it was declared a heresy. This impacted the Church greatly because it will later contribute to the splitting of the Church. We can learn that one line in the Nicene Creed is very important because it states that Jesus is human and divine. Athanasius was the Bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, but we now refer to him as St. Athanasius. When he was appointed bishop, he was constantly harassed by the Iranian bishops for his differing belief that Jesus is related to God, since they are two realities that can't be separated. Therefore, the Iranians set false accusations against him to get him out of office, and due to this, Athanasius was removed five times from office and spent 17 years of his life in exile. Due to this conflict, Athanasius was an apologist to the Iranians. Athanasius wrote the biography called The Life of Antony, which has a huge impact on the church since it is one of our few accounts of early church history. We can learn courage from Athanasius since he was very brave and courageous in defending his faith and beliefs. Ambrose was born into a Roman Christian family in 340 AD. His dad was the Praetorian Prefect of Gaul and his mother was a woman of intellect and piety. 
After his father had died, Ambrose was sent to Rome to become a lawyer. Around the late 4th century, a conflict arose in the Diocese of Milan between the Catholics and Arians regarding the succession of the new bishop. And Ambrose, in order to stop the conflict, was appointed Archbishop of Milan and many years later became the patron saint of Milan. Ambrose was also one of the four original doctors of the church, or one out of four individuals who many churches recognize as having been particular importance, specifically regarding their contribution to theology or doctrine. Ambrose was also the patron saint of bees, beekeepers, candle makers, chandlers, domestic animals, and students. His feast day is on December 7th. It was also known that through his teachings, Augustine converted to Christianity. Ambrose, being an archbishop and one of the four doctors of the church, contributed majorly his ideas of theology and doctrine in which, in which shaped part of the church we know today. Ambrose based many of his teachings off of working for unity, and by using these teachings today, we can learn to unify as a community and to shape a better church for the future. St. Augustine, born in North Africa to a pagan father and a Christian mother, was a convert to the Christian faith and later found a calling as Bishop of Hippo. Before his conversion, at the age of 16, he was not able to afford tuition. He dropped out of school, began drinking and gambling, and took a mistress. He became a Manichaean, yet found the religion dissatisfying, according to his autobiography titled The Confessions. His mother, Monica, a firm believer in the Christian faith, prayed for his conversion. It was Monica's prayers, as well as the guidance of St. Ambrose, that led to Augustine's baptism and faith life. Once converted, Augustine began writing on matters of theological importance. His writings and firm belief were so influential that he was made Bishop of Hippo, located towards the northeastern corner of present-day Anaba, Algeria, in Africa. His story is relevant today because it's the story of a sinner turned into a believer. It shows that we are always welcomed into the faith, even when we sin. We can also read his teachings to learn more about the faith. St. Monica was a virtuous early Christian saint who was very devoted to God. She suffered greatly in her life through the adultery of her husband against her and through the troubled life that her son Augustine led as a young man. However, the lesson that we can learn from St. Monica is that of perseverance. She continually prayed for her husband and son. In the end, she ended up converting her husband and mother-in-law before their deaths and her son as well through her extensive prayers and loving influence in his life. She later followed Augustine on his journeys to Milan, and they spent endless amounts of time together growing deeper in their faith. Monica's perseverance and boundless faith in God and his abilities show themselves in her unwillingness to give up on her son and her stubbornness to bring him to God. Okay. <laughs> Manichaean Heresy a young man named Augustine was religiously and morally confused in the beginning years of his life. He was the son of Monica, a Christian woman, but Augustine became a Manichaean for nine years until he later converted to Christianity. Manichaeans are dualists, and they believe in two gods, one god of light and one god of darkness. Augustine was an intelligent young man, and Manichaeism satisfied his intellect. Because one of the beliefs of Manichaeism is that there is no personal responsibility for sins, Augustine was able to lead a life with a mistress and was able to drink and gamble without committing a sin, according to Manichaeism. Manichaeans practice this way by participating in the light and avoiding the darkness within oneself. Manichaeism played an important role in influencing other Christian heresies. For some early Christians, Manichaeism caused them to question the devil's position. They may have elevated him to be more than the minor figure he is in the Bible. It is tempting to blame things on the devil without taking responsibility for our own faults and sins. We must not elevate the devil into some sort of godlike figure. We must remember that there is only one true God who can conquer all. The Donatist heresy was prominent in the 4th and 5th century. A heresy is a belief or opinion contrary to a religion's doctrine. This heresy started to evolve as a result of the Christian persecutions, mainly from the Roman Emperor Diocletian. As we already know, when the persecution started, there were some Christians who lied about being Catholic or betrayed the community, and then wanted to be welcomed back into the community. These people were called apostates. The Donatists called people who gave information to the Romans sinners. Some Christians accepted apostates and traitors, and some did not. Bishop Donatus was one who did not believe apostates should be welcomed back into the community or trusted. He believed that anyone who had betrayed them to the Romans had mortally sinned and did not deserve to come back. He didn't believe that these people were still entitled to baptize people or give them any of the sacraments for that matter. 
The Donatists argued that the validity of the sacraments depended on the worthiness of the priest or bishop who administered it. Therefore, if the priest was a sinner, the sacrament would not be valid. This went against the Catholic teaching, which said that the sacraments are actions of Christ that come to us through human beings who are liable to sin. The Church said the legitimacy of the sacrament came from God rather than the human being. The Donatists, however, did not believe God were through weak human beings. This was the Donatists' main issue with Catholics. They began to obtain more and more followers, creating a division in the Church. In North Africa, Donatist converts even outnumbered the Orthodox there. Donatists continued raising a sacrament's validity on the person who administered it, which left no faith in God's power and grace. This led to the Donatist practice of rebaptism, which the Catholics were extremely upset about. The Donatists argued some bishops were invalid due to their ordination by a traitor. For example, the Bishop Felix, who had given Bibles to Roman persecutors, Felix had started ordaining other priests who were distributing the sacraments. The Donatists believed these to be invalid and offered rebaptism to these people. These issues were brought to councils, which always found the bishops valid and never sided with the Donatists. Eventually, the Donatists died out with the help of Augustine. The Donatist heresy can teach us that we must forgive and remember that all human beings are imperfect, and that it is by the power of God's grace that we receive the sacraments not the power of the minister, because no person is morally pure. Heresy, a belief or opinion contrary to Orthodox religious doctrine, especially Christianity. The Pelagians were originally named after Pelagius, a 17th century monk and preacher who opposed the idea of predestination. The Pelagian heresy is a group of Christians whose views contrast with those of Augustine and the Church. The Pelagians' disagreement with the Church caused great amounts of controversy because they had contrasting views, something the Church did not like. Pelagians believed and taught that people can get to heaven without the special inner help and love of God called grace. Augustine argued that without God's grace, even more sin and injustice would trouble the world. However, the Pelagians completely believed that people are responsible for their actions and can't just leave it all up to God. They believed heaven was to be earned through taking responsibility for your acts and that salvation would be offered through a person's own efforts. What do you think? Do you side with Augustine that the judgment for your actions lies in the palm of God's hand? Or do you side with the Pelagians that mistakes and acts need to be taken responsibility for? This is applicable to modern day because we still don't know if predestination or the Pelagian heresy is a part of God's plan. We can form our own opinions through the evidence and people who came before us. St. Augustine and his reactions to erring groups and the sacraments. While St. Augustine was a bishop, he began to write about things that disputed incorrect groups of Christians. The first group is called Donatists. The Donatists were opposed by St. Augustine and his writings about the sacraments. The Donatists were Christians who had their own church in Africa, and they believed that those who denied their faith during the Roman persecutions of the Christians could never be forgiven. So, they believed that the bishops who were unfaithful or who had cooperated with the Roman power were then never able to give real baptisms. So, they thought that the ability to give a sacrament depends on the virtuousness of the person who conducts it. Augustine goes against this in saying that the validity of the sacrament doesn't come from how morally right or sinless the minister is, rather it comes from God, for God works through sinful and weak humans. He believed the Donatists left no room for God's own power and grace. This lesson Augustine taught helped explain the Catholic theology of sacraments. Another group he opposed were the Pelagians. They believed that a person could not go to heaven with the inner help of God, so they thought that one had to get there through their own works. Augustine goes against this by noting that the Pelagians had denied the need of God's grace, which would ultimately save people. Augustine knew the church's doctrine about original sin, for we all have it. He knew that without God's grace, we are unable to even overcome this want to sin. He taught that God's grace would ultimately prevail and allow us to overcome sin and achieve heaven. He said, Men are delivered from evil, and without which they do absolutely no good thing, making the argument that we cannot work alone. We need God and his everlasting grace. And this also helps explain the Catholic theology of getting to heaven. Today, as Christians, we must take away the fact that we all sin. Augustine knew his faults, and we must know our own. We must recognize that we will sin no matter what, but we must be thankful and know that with God's love works through us in grace, we are truly able to overcome this sin. And we must let God into our lives and let him lead us on the tremendous path to eternal life.
God gives us grace as a special inner help to get us to heaven. God shows his grace by saving us from sin's punishment when we trust in Jesus as our Savior, by giving us strength and guidance, and by taking care of us every day. His grace gives us strength to handle difficult problems in our lives, and it helps us live for him. Pelagians believed that God's grace was unnecessary and a person could get to heaven without this inner help from him. Augustine showed opposition to this view in his teachings on grace and original sin. He wrote that without God's grace, we wouldn't be able to overcome the tendency to sin that we inherited from Adam and Eve. In addition, he argued that God's grace helped us turn away evil, and without it there would be even more sin and injustice in the world. Some people today think as the Pelagians did in believing that we can do everything on our own without God's help. But from Augustine's teachings, we can learn that we do need God's help to turn away from sin, make good decisions, give us strength during difficult times, and ultimately make it into heaven. The idea of Nestorianism was based off of the teachings from the Bishop of Constantinople named Nestorius, who attempted to give a logical explanation on the human and divine essences of Jesus Christ. Nestorius taught that the humanity and divinity of Christ are two separate people, the man Jesus Christ and the divine logos, or the spirit of God. He explained that Jesus himself was a human, but the divine logos eventually came to be in him. Nestorius also taught that because Mary had given birth to a human and not God, she was not Theodokos, or the mother of God. Nestorianism was strongly opposed by St. Cyril of Alexandria, who helped outline the Orthodox teaching of the Church, which was sent to Nestorius, accusing him of a heresy, or a belief or theory that strongly differs with the beliefs of the Church. Nestorianism was officially called a heresy after two councils, and led to the Nestorian Schism, which was the separation of Nestorianism from the rest of the Christian Church. As we know, the Nestorians taught and believed that Mary did not, in fact, give birth to God, but to a human. This was a very controversial topic during this time, and in order to absolve these disputes, Theodosius II, who was the emperor of the Byzantine Empire, called the Council of Ephesus in 431 in order to conclude the matter. Nestorius persuaded Theodosius to call this meeting, believing he would be proven correct, therefore proving St. Cyril incorrect and potentially having him condemned. At this council, there were 250 bishops in attendance. This was because this was such a controversial topic, many people wanted to voice their opinion at this council. During the span of the council, there was great tension, especially between St. Cyril and Theodosius. At the end of the council, they declared Mary is a God-bearer, or in Greek, Theodokos. From this council, the church has realized that the Nestorians weren't completely inaccurate in their beliefs and ideas, because, when looked at in a philosophical way, we are able to better understand who Jesus is. This contribution to the church helped us understand and presented problems towards the idea of a hypostatic union. This was the idea that Jesus has two natures of both human and divine. Today we learn that Jesus is a unique character by being both human and divine from the ideas presented at this council. From this council, we learn the importance of standing by your faith and having the courage to voice your opinion. The Monophysites had a belief that Jesus had a single nature, that he was divine. This challenged the doctrine of the hypostatic union, which was the belief that Jesus was both God and man. The Monophysites taught that Jesus was born human and then became divine in degrees. They also taught that in the end, Jesus was all divine and not human. While councils were called to try and discuss the issue, they often ended badly with riots, one of which fatally injured the patriarch or bishop of Constantinople. Welcome to the Council of Chalcedon. The Council of Chalcedon was where the definition of the faith was written. It was called in 451 by Pope Leo. The council took place in the city of Chalcedon, which is what it was named after. Some of the contributions the council made to the church were that it settled the controversy. It decided that Christ was of two natures. He is truly God and he is truly human. And this heresy was believed by the majority of bishops at the council. 
The Council of Chalcedon also decided the definition of the faith. The church then split into two sects after dispute. One was the East, which was Syrian, and one was the West, which was Ethiopian. Also, the council decided that councils would now be overseen by bishops. Formerly, the Pope was seen as the first in authority, followed by the bishops in Antioch and Alexandria, which were the second in authority. However, the council decided that now the Pope would be first in authority. However, he would be followed instead by the Patriarch of Constantinople. Disputes between East and West churches led to a break between them, mostly due to the Eastern Emperor in Constantinople having too much power and influence of the church. This led the two sects to split completely. Some lessons that can be applied and learned today are that we learn what salvation is from the Council of Chalcedon. Also, we learn that Jesus is fully human, just like us, which inspires hope for our faith. Additionally, we learn that Jesus is like us in humanity, so we learn that we can be one with him in his divinity. And this is the way to express the mystery of salvation. The, defini the definition of the faith is what expresses this mystery of salvation, and that is what we learn from the Council of Chalcedon. Thank you for listening. The Roman Empire was progressively crumbling, leading up to the ultimate fall of Rome in 410. Western Rome was attacked by the barbarians, tribes of nomadic people commonly referred to as Goths, on August 24th in f of the year 410. This event is commonly referred to as the Sack of Rome. Western Rome continued to lose land to the barbarians, and Eastern Rome became known as the Byzantine Empire from its former name, the Eastern Roman Empire. Meanwhile, the political and religious divisions between the East and the West continued to widen. Barbarian invasions caused the falling of the Western Empire and threatened the state power, so the Church and Pope interfered as leaders of stability, order, and peace in the West. However, in the East, state power was very strong and the emperors dominated both politics and the Church. Eastern emperors were often Arians, um, heretical Christians who denied the divinity of Christ, and they forced many people to convert to Arianism. So when the barbarians invaded other parts, they not only took the land, but they also spread the Arian faith. These conflicts of church and state are a part of what is known as the Dark Ages. During the Dark Ages, people had a strong belief that God ruled over creation and hoped that if, like Jesus, they endured constant suffering, they would go to heaven. They believed that God had a watchful eye and protected those who did good and punished the wrongdoers. The Dark Ages alludes to a philosophy of both God's grace and the devil's presence and power. As the Dark Ages began the office of Pope, the Bishop of Rome, gained increasing importance in this time of uncertainty and tribal warfare in the West. Through this time of uncertainty, Pope Leo the Great found a balance between the Pope as a political and religious leader. Leo the Great, or Leo I, was elected Pope in the year of 440, shaped the leadership of the Pope throughout the Western world while facing the attacks against the Roman Empire and the faith from all sides. Known for his peacemaking and short but eloquent sermons, Leo the Great was able to fill the complicated role that, of the Pope that the Church needed. The Pope was involved in the affairs of the Church and the State. The involvement of the Pope in state affairs was evident when Leo was asked to intervene and make peace with Attila the Hun the fierce leader of the barbarian tribe that was invading Italy. Till the Hun moved westward into Italy, burning towns and killing as he pleased. Knowing the Western Roman Empire did not have enough military strength to stop Attila, Leo intervened to negotiate peace. Leo stood face to face with Attila's army and asked for peace. The words that he said are not known, but the conversation resulted in Attila the Hun turning back and Rome was saved. Years later, Leo was called again to be a peacemaker, an army of vandals from North Africa tried to attack Rome, but Leo intervened and got them to agree not to kill anyone and eventually sail back to Africa. The government relied on Leo to face their enemies, knowing they could not face them themselves, making the Pope a key figure in the government. The significance of the Pope led Leo to use the title of Pontifus Maximus, or Supreme Pontiff. The high priest was seen as a bridge between God and human beings. The title still today refers to to the Pope and Leo's power. Leo was not only a religious leader, but also a mediator, both religious and political, a leader, 
as a spiritual father, the Pope, and a political leader, and a peacemaker. From his peacemaking, we can learn that violence is not the answer. Pope Leo was able to protect the Roman Emperor through negotiation, not violence. He stood face to face with an army and talked of peace. Pope Leo's peacemaking prevented wars and many deaths, showing the power of peace and nonviolence. Pope Leo also taught us that the church and state can work together, and the Pope is both a strong political and religious leader. The Pope today plays a great role in the church and the politics of Rome. During his time as Pope, Pope Leo also called the Council of Chalcedon to discuss the challenges of incarnation, the belief that Jesus was both God and man. As a result of the Council, the Pope was declared preeminent among all Christian bishops, and that Constantinople was second in authority. This dispute over the authority of Constantinople as second led to centuries of disputes between the Christians in the West, led by the Pope, Christians in the East, led by Constantinople. One of the earliest monastics was Anthony of Egypt. He experienced Christianity, persecution, and legal conditions. In 270, he moved to the desert when he was still a young man to pray. Anthony believed in helping others, so he sold all of his possessions so he could seek out his destiny. After being taught by an old man, he became known in the village as God loved. As he grew older, people sought him out to teach them. Anthony became a hermit. He was famous for his wisdom and stories. Anthony moved to the Egyptian wilderness after the quiet desert he once loved became busier and he got a call from God drawing him there. Anthony was a model to the church because of his humility, piety, and self-discipline that he taught. He was able to give different people advice on how to confront demons. Because of Anthony, we learn that we can face our everyday temptations knowing that God is helping us and that in heaven, piety will be the one treasure. We can also use Anthony as an example when we become materialistic and selfish. Just like Anthony did, we are guided by God to help those in need. It could be the homeless or the sick, or just someone in need of a friend. This is what Anthony of Egypt showed us. Basil lived in the 4th century from about 329 to 379. He was known for care of the poor and underprivileged. In the mid-300s, Basil, a monk and bishop, found that a community was necessary to guide monastics on the path to God. Basil created the first rules for ordering monastic life. Basil stressed simple living and obedience to an abbot. His definition of simple living was owning almost nothing, eating only when necessary, and obeying the abbot of the monastery. We can learn several lessons from Basil and the other monks. Their main job was to see God in their hearts through prayer, and also care for the sick and help the poor. And just as these monks in the 4th century did these things, we should too. It is our job to help care for the sick and help the poor. Jerome was a 4th century monk who lived as a hermit. Jerome made a big impact with his translations of the Bible. Before, he was native in a different language, but then he was educated in Latin and Greek by some of the best teachers. At age 18, Jerome decided to follow, follow his mother, who had been baptized as a Christian. He eventually went to Rome and served as the Pope's secretary. The Pope encouraged him to translate the New Testament and Psalms into Latin the language commonly used, vernacular by most people in Western Rome at the time. This took 15 years for Jerome to translate and became known as the Latin Vulgate. His major contributions were translating the Bible to Latin because it was the most common language of that time. A lesson we can learn is that everyone is accepted Jerome tried to involve everyone while translating so others could become interested in their faith and deeper with the meaning.